Welcome into the channel everyone. Today we're going to try not to burn my little shop down because we're going to be throwing sparks with three different gouging techniques. Let's talk about it. Now gouging material is not to get confused with cutting material. However, they're pretty much the same. All three of these processes can cut material, cut metal. They can cut any metal actually. However, we're not trying to cut today. We're trying to gouge, which means just to remove a little bit of metal at a time in order to say, find a repair or dig out some discontinuities. In this case, I've got a piece of 3 8 plate, not super thick, but we have it welded all the way out and we slam the gap shut to where there is plenty of sound material in there and the back side has this long line of incomplete fusion. We're gonna use our three methods of gouging today, which is going to be first our angle grinder. Now we're gonna go over proper techniques, handling, whatnot. It can still cut, especially if you put the right abrasive on. We're gonna use that old cut and grind today. So again, it could do both. And then we're gonna switch over to the plasma cutter. If you remember this video we did a while back on beveling with the plasma cutter, we used this Radner 45 amp plasma cutter and it came with some gouge tips. We're gonna see what that's all about, how that performs compared to switching that machine back to traditional cutting tips and traditional cutting mode and seeing if we can still gouge with it. After that, we're gonna to switch to the mama, big mama jamma of them all is the carbon art cutting or carbon art gouging process. And we're gonna go over the size of machine that you might would need. We're gonna go over a smaller machine. So now we're gonna dive into it, jumping on our first section here, which is grinding. Now, obviously safety wise, we wanna get suited up, got our FR gear. I've got double eye protection. Anytime we're running a cutoff wheel, a cut and grind wheel, grinding disc, anything that's a portable bonnet disc, we should have double eye protection on. Today, we're gonna to be rocking the six inch 3M grinder here. This is a paddle switch grinder. Make sure you're looking at the label on here so you can match the RPMs to the abrasive that you're using. Today, we're gonna to be using the eighth inch cut and grind disc. This one's gonna be able to operate on the side of the grinder here. Whereas say like a quarter inch grinding disc, it even says it right there on the grinding disc, do not run on its side. Where this one says, you can run it on its side. Today we don't have that much, so we're just gonna opt for the four and a half inch grinding disc. For me, I love holding my grinder upside down. The biggest reason why I like holding it upside down compared to say this way, the grinder is really blocking a lot of our view. We wanna make sure we have, of course, our guard on our grinder and our handle, but we really need to be able to see what we're doing. So I typically will hold my grinder here on the back side. Anyway, I can hold my switch, I will, and I'll work things back and forth, scoring that line first, trying to open it up, get a line started, and then I might work this grinder back and forth to open it up, even so much as turning it at an angle just to get things to open up a little bit more. The goal is to take that line completely away with this grinding disc as we work things back and forth. Most of the time you're gonna be wanting to hold the handle as well. I'm not a big fan of holding the handle because I can brace against the material and I can feel the metal where I'm at and I can really help control my pressure a little bit more. But here we go, we're gonna go ahead and rip this thing open with the eighth inch cut and grind. We'll make sure our hood is flipped to grind mode here. We'll lightly score it. Just lightly scoring it right now just to make sure I stay on line and everything's nice and straight because if you were to do a back weld on there, you'd want to basically make a new bevel here on the back. If you look close enough, you can still see there is a line. We did some pretty good job welding this sucker and we didn't have to really get down too deep. However, I am seeing a little bit of a line all the way across. So we're gonna open it up, give us some more room for a weld. This is where I'll typically take that grinding disc and maybe even give it a little bit of an angle or kind of work it back and forth to kind of give myself a little bit bigger of an opening. Maybe turn it over now and get a little bit of love on that bottom side. The nice thing about it is the more you grind, the more you can see. And I'm still seeing a line of incomplete fusion. So that's kind of rule 101 when it comes to gouging. Whatever you're looking for, you're supposed to gouge it till it's gone. I think I'd say I'm happy with that. We probably removed at least a quarter of an inch of depth, which I remember putting a pretty heavy land on there. Maybe not quite that heavy, but we got past that line all the way across and that's what you're trying to do and if you're trying to you know prep things you can even use this grinding disc 
because it is that cut and grind, you can go ahead and prep that. That's probably the nicest part compared to these other two processes about using a grinder is the fact that we've already gouged into the material. It's already prepped. It's already ready to weld. Whereas these other two, we can get probably faster through the material. We're still going to have to use the grinder afterwards. That looks pretty solid now. Let's switch to that plasma cutter. Now I'll say that grinding is probably your cheapest version of metal gouging that you can come by. You just need your grinder and a good abrasive and you're off to the races. Now with plasma gouging, you're going to need obviously your plasma cutter. Not only that, but you're going to need air to hook up to it and good power. This is a dual voltage machine, this Radner 45 amp machine. We'll kick it on. Right now I've got a hook up to 240 or 220, so it's got all the power that you can get out of it right now. If you look through the modes on this machine, whether we're on expanded metal mode at 75 PSI, cutting mode on 75 PSI, if we switch to gouge mode, it drops that PSI to 52. Just like we don't necessarily need more amperage, we don't need as much air in order to get through the material because we're not trying to cut we're trying to gouge. That's gonna force that arc to not necessarily punch through, but kind of arc off to the side, especially with the angle that we're trying to run, and it's going to remove that metal for us. This welding hood is probably gonna need somewhere around like a shade eight now for cutting. And as far as the air coming into the torch that you need, it's really subjective to the plasma cutter you have. So look at the manual, you'll see it right here. 3.2 CFM at 72 PSI. If we look at my compressor outside, we should be fine. Not to say that you can't have a smaller compressor than this, but you gotta think of how much cutting that you're gonna be doing. If you're gonna maybe run a CNC table and you're gonna have long cuts, you're gonna want a compressor that outworks you. If you're just saying running one of these machines out in the field, you could probably run it out of a little pancake compressor if all you're doing is cutting like quarter inch material and only a little bits at a time, let the compressor catch up and then keep going. The one thing that I am curious about when it comes to this machine is it came with some gouging tips. I've never seen gouge tips before. It looks like the shield, but the nozzle itself has a wider hole and it's a little bit recessed in there. So I think more of that arc can fan out a little bit more so you can do potentially more gouging. Maybe turn it down a little bit at 30 amps, see how that does. And then we'll switch it to cut mode and put these other consumables on about halfway through and see if we can't match it. The worst thing about this is we're still gonna have to hit it with the grinder afterwards because we don't want to weld over anything plasma gouged or cut. Now for this one we're going to start on our grinded spot. It's going to be nice and clean. We don't want to be angled in whatsoever. If we're angled in we're going to be more cutting or squirting it all right back at our face. We want to have like a 35 45 degree angle on it and we want to be as close as possible. I wouldn't say we want to just drag it across because you're going to notice this, this arc is going to want to still kind of punch but it will push out I don't know if I want to dig as much as I want to try to keep a little bit of a wiggle side to side to just make sure I get the material out and then I can make some sweeps across if I need any more. Just kind of trying to work it back and forth. We're gouging. Try that whole thickness that we were grinding at. We got it pretty much right where we need to, we'll probably just grind the rest. The goal is just to kind of scuff the surface to get any of those oxides off and even up what we've done. I'm trying to match it to this grind. And at the end of the day, I'm still looking for that line running through there. It looks like I got it. Anywhere we touch with that plasma cutter really needs to be more than just wire wheeled. It needs to be clean. And I can see that, you know, that that bevel's getting wider and wider. My groove got wider and wider. That's something you don't want to do. That's going to require more work for you down the road. We want to get some depth into it. So I could have tightened up my pattern there, maybe turned down my amperage to something a little bit lower. But I think after a little bit more grinding, I see a little bit of that line back through here. I want to just make sure I get all that plasma cut bits and then we'll switch some settings. So all I'm gonna do now, take this shield off. That's that gouge shield, it's wider. And we're gonna keep the same electrode and swirl ring on there. Those are still plenty good. And then we're gonna put the regular cutting consumables back on. And all we're gonna switch now is go back into cut mode. And you can imagine it's gonna have more PSI. We're running 30 amps, and 30 amps, I think I got carried away with the plasma gouging on that one. So I'm probably gonna turn this thing down and see. We can only go down to 20. Let's try 20 amps. We might have to have even more of a lean. The goal is just not to cut through the plate. We're trying to sweep it away. Oh, I 
definitely feel like I gotta move faster. Oh, that's kind of satisfying. All right, that actually went really well. Probably can make another sweep to go a little deeper because I still see that line. Now you can plasma gouge any material, just like you could grind any material. That's kind of the nice thing about it. If it can conduct electricity, you can gouge it. But the drawbacks there is you still, still are gonna have to whip out the grinder to clean things up afterwards, even if you did get that line all the way at all in the first run. Now we can switch that off. We're gonna go ahead and shut down the plasma cutter, kick on the welding machine, and do some that classic CAC, baby. Now carbon art gouging, like plasma cutting, you're able to cut or gouge any metal you want. So if you had the question or not whether you could do carbon steel or stainless steels or whatever, you can. You can gouge anything with carbon art gouging. The biggest thing is, again, with the afterwards, there's gonna be some stuff that you're gonna need to clean up. The rods, after all, are made out of carbon, so maybe it might not be the biggest issue on carbon steel. You still wanna knock that off. When you're doing stainless steels and other materials that are really sensitive to carbon and cross, what is it, carbide precipitate, whatever it may be, you're gonna to wanna to grind that off. Not to say that it's seeping in, but you definitely need to get the surface stuff off. It's similar to plasma cutting and the fact that we're gonna be using compressed air. We're gonna hook that up. The amount of air you need, best advice I can give you is a lot of it. On the smaller side of stuff, maybe 60 PSI, but on the higher stuff, we're gonna be needing like 100 PSI in order to blow the metal that we're trying to blow away. And then we'll be able to hook up our whip. You'll notice this little block on the end has a spot where you could put a lug where your cable goes and then you could put your air in here i'm not gonna hook this up because it's kind of loud now as far as what machine you need i would say with carbon art gouging you just need a constant current kind of machine so it's got to be able to be a cc machine so it's typically like your tig and stick machines all are constant current machines if it's on stick mode set it to stick and if it has a carbon art gouging mode it's probably nice to go ahead and use it I would say on the smaller side of stuff, minimum you're gonna need at least 200 amps. This is a 335 amp machine, and it's a 100% duty cycle of 330 amps. So it's definitely got the power to run the electrode that we're gonna be using today. We're also going to be using a smaller inverter just to try out. I've never tried that at all. And I did go in and turn down the machine because I did want to speak on it a little bit more. We have our machine set to DC positive. The stingers run into the end of the lead here, and then we ha we'll have our air hooked up in a second, but it's a little too loud too. The biggest thing I want to talk about is this carbon arc torch here. The amperage we're running really is based on the electrode diameter. These are your carbon arc electrodes. They're really brittle. They're copper coated, and if you break them apart, you can see all that carbon on there. I think it's mostly graphite. Let us know if you know what the alloys that are in one of these rods are. This is what we're going to be using and what we'll put into our our whip here. Now you'll also notice that this is a little bit bulkier than say your stick stinger and you'll notice it also has like this pivot point right here at the top. You can move this around and that helps if you're getting in all different types of angles and situations but one thing you want to try to maintain is the amount of distance that you have to the end of the stinger to the air that is coming out of the holes here. We don't want to be running our stinger way the heck out here because we're not going to have enough power from the a lot of air that we need to be running and pushing. So we're going to run this thing maybe a quarter of it or a third of it, and then we should be pretty good. The other thing is we want to notice where that, those holes are actually located. I want the holes to be underneath the electrode that I'm doing. So if I'm gouging like this, the air is underneath and it blows up and away. If we maybe say turn our hand over and we want to go the other direction, well now those circles are on the wrong side and we're going to be making soup. Basically all that air is going to be coming down and it's not going to be pushing it the direction that we want. We also don't want to necessarily be at too much of an angle like we did with the plasma gouging. We want to be a little bit straighter on and that's going to kick all that metal out. We can put our air in here. Whoa, you can see that. It's a lot of air, right? So it's going to be coming out of there like a freaking hurricane. So we'll load up our electrode right here. Again, this is where we're gonna be trying to aim not too far out of there, and we're just going to be just making a straight push. We don't wanna drag it, straight push, maybe not so much of an angle, and just trying to delete that line right there. 300 amps, these electrodes can handle even more, and these diameters get even thicker. You'll see these electrodes needing 400, 500 amps sometimes, and even longer ones. It's not likely y'all are gonna be able to hear me talk about anything as I'm doing it, so let's just hear some of the wonderful ASMR that is carbon art gouging.
got a little bit more carried away than I intended. I only meant to do half of this because I still want to show you guys a little something else. We're, we're running 300 amps. So you're going to want a darker shade in here, maybe like a shade 11 or 12. Whereas here we're like shade three, like a shade eight, like a shade 11. What I love about this is I can make one clean sweep with this, the depth that I needed at 300 amps and it just takes care of pretty much that entire line gets just deleted. And again, you'll come through with your grinder, clean things up. Cleaned up a lot of that crap with a chisel, but of course this cut grind, we can get rid of the rest. In my experience, that's probably what I've done the most of was either the grinding or the carbon arc gouging. In my experience, guys, make sure you clean the crap out of it. I had to be ultrasound tested and x-rayed when it came to pressure vessels, and we did a lot of back gouging and grinding on carbon steel and stainless steel. Nine times out of 10, if something came back at this point, it was because you didn't clean that gouge enough. We know that we were able to run off a bigger machine that's 330 amps. What happens if we run off a smaller machine? Can we get by? We're gonna kick this thing on and max out the freaking amperage on it. This is as small as a welder as it gets. We're gonna keep it on your basic electrodes, maxed out at 180, running DC positive. We're just gonna clamp this onto the same whip. We're gonna run the same air and just see if it works. Come on, I believe in you. Honestly, I'm pretty surprised. Got a really deep gouge in there. I mean, I would say it was just as deep as this one once we really started getting into it and that arc was stable enough to carry and then it kind of puttered out. But again, we're using way bigger of an electrode than this machine is rated. These do get a little smaller. I bet if we went down in the electrode size, that honestly would work just fine. We need a little bit of arc and we need a little bit of air. So what happens if we only have a 6010 and compressed air? Now we're gonna do a little bit on the farm gouging. It's hard. How do you do the thing? I gotta like. All right, maybe without the air. Let's just try with a ton of 6010. Ah! Oh God, I popped a hole in the hose. Ah, poo. Well, that was certainly out of hand. <laughs> now, there are a lot of ways to gouge, guys. More than just these three that I showed y'all today. You can gouge with a cutting torch, airless gouging rods, those exist too. You could probably get a little bit more creative than what I did today in order to get rid of some material, but I'll leave you with some food for thought, and that is a weld symbol for a back gouge. There isn't one, but what you will see is some notes being left in the tail of things. As an example, is this being a single V-groove on 3 8 plate all the way across with this back gouge. You might see it one of two ways. This has got the weld symbol showing us that we'll have a groove weld right here. This is what I have labeled as the depth of prep. So say if this is 3 8 plate, maybe we only prepped a quarter of an inch into it, right? That gives us our prep there, and then we make our weld, and then it's telling us to go on the back side there with the depth of prep being maybe probably another an eighth of an inch in order to get that U groove it's asking for that we kind of had with a lot of these gouging techniques. And then we put our back weld on there afterwards. Uh, you might see it with the orientations being kind of more of a step-by-step -step thing where it says, go ahead and make, make that groove first. Maybe have the, the root opening and even a groove angle on there with the depth of prep. And then it'll have a secondary symbol up here that says the depth of prep with the groove. Same thing, but the gouging is even on here, right? Where you'll find that is here in the tail. It'll say back, back gouge back grind, back gouge. But that'll give you some food for thought. If I didn't explain the weld symbols good enough, we do have our partners over there at the American Welding Program that have a really great course on weld symbols if you need to brush up on it or maybe you just wanna buy the book on its own. We got the links down below from the Lincoln Ranger, the Lincoln Sprinter, the Radnor 45 amp plasma cutter, and of course all the consumables and whips that you saw here today. Thanks for watching everyone. We'll see you guys on the next weld.